How many of you, by show of hands, have seen the Aurora Borealis? Yeah. That's the nice thing about living in Bozeman, is that you, uh, you often have an opportunity to see this wonderful event. Uh, here's some pictures of it. <laughs> Uh, those are all front door stuff. I can see uh, Russia. <laughs> That's not from my doorstep. <laughs> That's from That's from uh, outer space. Okay. <laughs> this This is a magnetic phenomenon. Okay. Um, every now and again, we have a storm on the sun, and one of these prominences erupts, spewing charged energetic particles our way. We call this the solar wind. And those would fry us if it weren't for the magnetic field of the Earth, and uh, for reasons we'll talk about later in this lecture, those charged energetic particles get trapped in the magnetic field line, we call them the Van Allen belt, of the Earth. Now, those charged particles are forced to stream along the field lines, which is interesting because we found on an exam, and actually on the tutorial, that that's not what electric charges do in an electric field. But electric charges in a magnetic field do stream along the field lines. And those field lines for the Earth come out of the South Pole and go into the North Pole. Now, what that means is that these charged particles, when they come from the sun, end up streaming down through the atmosphere at one of the two poles. And as they cascade down through the atmosphere, they excite the molecules in the atmosphere. Those excited molecules drop down into the ground state, giving off photons that are very colorful. And that's the aurora borealis. Now, to give you the size of these things, that prominence there, uh, that's the size of the Earth. Okay? So these things are huge. And we're going to find in lecture today that that is a magnetic field. Okay? And that magnetic field just happens to be loaded down with very energetic charged particles. Yes? When you said we follow the field lines, why don't we only have it at the North Pole? What's that? You said that the charged particles follow the field line and we have a magnetic field, and you know, the magnetic field flows from south to north. Why don't we only have the aurora borealis at the north? We have it at the North Pole and the South Pole. We have it at both poles. Oh, if it's following the field lines. It's following the field lines, and they come down north and south. And we can only see them because we're close to the North Pole. We're, we're seeing them. Um, we'll, we'll see the magnetic field due to the Earth in a slide a little later on. And it's not just right at the North Pole. It's in the vicinity of the North Pole. So we're just we're so close to where Santa Claus works. We could be elves. We could be elves. Good question, though. Now, um, I got to tell you, uh, we have in this department one of the premier solar physics uh, groups, research groups in the world. And, um, and we actually uh, have a satellite that's driven from the second floor of this building. Uh, David McKinsey actually drives a satellite, and uh, so we know when these eruptions are happening, and, and every now and again we get emails uh, saying, hey, if you go out tonight and tomorrow night, you're going to likely see the aurora borealis, because they're tied together. They're tied together. Now, the reason we have such a marvelous uh, research group, uh, it's kind of interesting. 22 years ago, uh, we were having a faculty meeting, and the department head said, Laura Napton wants to join our faculty. We said, well, that's not the way it's done. You, we gotta have a position, we gotta have a search, we gotta have a, you know, open search. And the department head said, he's an astronaut, he has $3 million, 
and he just needs a chair to sit in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> as soon as he came here, we had just very prominent uh, scientists in the field of, of solar physics come to Montana, and then we started getting grad students from Harvard, and it was just a marvelous thing. And as a result, we are on the map, so to speak, in solar physics. Okay, that's not going to be on the exam. What do we know about magnets? Well, we already know that they're not charged rods. Remember, we studied that. Um, we found that if we took a negatively charged rod, that a bar magnet would attract that negatively charged rod with its north pole and with its south pole. <coughs> but we also found that if we had a positively charged glass rod, the same thing happened. The north pole attracts it, and the south pole attracts it. So both the north and the south pole are attracted to both positive and negative rods. That means that they are acting electrically like the neutral wooden rods. Okay? So electrically, they're neutral. We also know from the third grade that they have two poles, a north pole and a south pole. And for reasons that we'll explain, I like to call them the north seeking pole and the south pole seeking pole. Now we know that like poles repel and opposite poles attract. And in that sense they act very similar to an electric dipole. An electric dipole is a positive charge and a negative charge. But if I have an electric dipole I can grab the positive charge and I can grab the negative charge and I can take them apart. I can take the positive charge into that room, and I can take the negative charge into that room and separate them into two separate charges. But with our north and south pole, they always seem to be found together. We never find a north pole by itself. We never find a south pole by itself. Indeed, if I had a... If I had a bar magnet here, and I do, this bar magnet has a north side and a south side. You see that uh, this is the north side that's attracting uh, this south pole of the compass needle. And uh, that's the south, whoops, let's zoom right out of there. Okay. So these are opposite poles. Now if I, with my uh, incredible professor strength, tear this apart, <laughs> what I find is that each of these pieces have a, a north and a south pole. And uh, it turns out that if I were really strong and could break that bar, I could break it into as many pieces as I like, and I would always find a north and a south pole. I would never be able to just break off one pole. Now, it, 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 it did happen in the 70s in Stanford that one scientist was able to isolate a single North Pole all by its onesies, and he published that. But unfortunately, no one else was able to duplicate it. And in physics, when you can do something that no one else can do, what does that make you? Higher. Yeah, more. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, he, he was wrong. Okay, and, and so as a result, we, we scoff and we uh, ridicule. It's a very cruel feel. Uh, once, once you're down, they just keep kicking you. Okay. Okay, so can we ever find an isolated pole? It, it appears not. And the model that we use is we associate a little magnetic dipole, a north and a south, with every single atom of the iron bar that we magnetize. 
And so that means that magnetizing a piece of iron is all about lining up all those little molecules or atoms so that their, their atomic level dipoles are lined up. And then you see that if you break that iron, you still have them all lined up. And so you still have a North Pole and a South Pole. And you can keep breaking that iron even down to the level of just a single atom, and you still have a North Pole and a South Pole. We'll talk more about that uh, next Monday. Now, magnetic field. Just like we had an electric field to get away from this action at a distance problem, in other words, if a charge here can put a push on a charge back there, how do we explain that? Well, this charge creates an electric field in the room everywhere, and the electric field pushes on that charge. Well, the same thing is going to be true with magnetic fields. If two things are pushing on each other magnetically without touching, what we say is the pusher creates a magnetic field everywhere in the room, and then that field pushes on the pushy. And in truth, they're pushing on each other by third law. They're each creating a field that's pushing on the other. Now, the direction of that field in the case of a magnetic field is very, very easy to visualize. All you have to do is take a compass and set it down. And the direction that that compass points is the direction of the magnetic field that it finds itself in. Okay? Now, that's clearly oversimplifying things. Because this compass needle, which is a little bar magnet, is constrained to rotate on its pivot in a plane, in a horizontal plane. If I had a compass needle, a little bar magnet, that was gimbaled so that it could point anywhere it wanted to, in this room it would point towards Canada and down 70 degrees. Okay? So it would point towards Canada and down 70 degrees. And that's the direction of the Earth's magnetic field here in Bozeman, is towards Canada and down 70 degrees. Now, we use the symbol B for the magnetic field, and this seems out of character. You remember we use the symbol E, capital E, for an electric field. And that made sense. But B, for the magnetic field, does not. And it turns out that we're honoring a dead professor, uh, Bill Sabar. Uh, and in honor of that professor who taught us a lot about magnetic fields, we use capital B. Okay? Now, we can visualize what a magnetic field looks like by taking a bunch of iron filings. And in the presence of a, of a magnetic field, those filings get turned into little bar magnets and they act like little compass needles. And you've all done that in grade school. You've dumped a whole bunch of filings uh, metal filings, iron filings on a piece of glass, and then you put a bar magnet underneath it. Now, just to make sure we're on the bus, that bar magnet is free to rotate about that red dot. It's going to rotate one quarter turn. It finds itself in a magnetic field pointing towards the open door. Will it rotate clockwise or counterclockwise? Tell your neighbor. Clockwise or counterclockwise? Okay. The compass needle, the
the part of the compass needle that has the arrow head is the north seeking part of the compass needle. It is the part that's labeled N. And so this thing would rotate clockwise a quarter turn. Okay? Now, that brings up a very interesting question. Well, before we ask that question, let's just look at the field due to a bar magnet. If I set a little compass down next to a bar magnet, Remember, this is just a bar magnet itself, with that being the North Pole, that being the South Pole. That South Pole is attracted to that North Pole, and it's going to line up like that. Okay? If I put it down here, that South Pole is attracted to that North, that North Pole is attracted to that South, and it will go like that. If I put it there, this north pole is attracted to that south pole, and it would go something like that. Now, I've done it at three places, but I could have done it at many more, and that would be the magnetic field due to a bar magnet. They seem to be coming out of a north and into a south, those arrows. Now, this brings us to the Canadian question of the day, eh? If the north pole of a compass needle is attracted to a south pole of a magnet, why does it point towards Canada, which is magnetic north? Huh? What side of the magnet you put the arrow on? Actually, it turns out that uh, any bar magnet that I have with an N on it is going to attract the south pole. The, the part that points towards Mexico. In other words, if I were to take a bar magnet that had an N and a S on it, you know, the red part being usually red, and I were to hang it from a string so that it could pivot, the N part is going to point towards Canada. Okay? But you're right, the problem is calling these things north and south. <clears throat> We should have called them red and blue, or A and B. Then there would be no confusion. But because we called the North Seeking Pole the North Pole, what we have in Canada must be a South Pole, because the North Seeking Pole is attracted to it. If we think of the Earth's magnetic field, we find exactly the same field as if there were a giant bar magnet right through the earth with the north magnetic pole down here where the penguins live and the south magnetic pole up there in Canada a little closer to uh, uh, the Hudson Bay. Okay? Now, these field lines come out of the north, wrap around and go into the south. Now you'll notice that uh, we don't live very far from Canada, eh? <laughs> okay? And that's why the field lines here point down about 70 degrees. Okay? Now, here's an interesting tidbit of fact. The magnetic north, which is actually the location of the south pole of the Earth's magnet, is in the Hudson Bay. It's about 1,300 kilometers from geographic north, and it's moved about 700 kilometers since uh, 1904. Uh, that great scientist, Lauren Acton, the astronaut that I told you about, uh, he's an expert on this field. I asked him about this, and he said, yes, the poles are actually in the process of flipping, that uh, every 200,000 years, they actually uh, flip and change places. And I believe him, he's been around for most of that time. Uh, and this process of flipping takes about 2,000 years to accomplish, to, to get things rotated around. Okay? So here's the location of the magnetic north, really a south pole, in 1904. And then uh, you can guess when this picture was made, 1984. It's old. 
Well, that's even older. Well, no, it's not, but it sure looks primitive. Okay. So right now it's moving towards geographic north, but it's still far way away. Now the fact that these two are not the same location, magnetic north and geographic north, uh, provides a complication when you're hiking. Uh, your compass that tells you which way to go is pointing towards Hudson Bay. But your map that you're trying to follow is always oriented towards geographic north, where Santa Claus lives. And those two places are not in the same location. Now, if you're lucky enough to live along this red line, say in Chicago, when you look at Hudson Bay or towards Hudson Bay, you're also looking towards Santa Claus's workshop. And so for those people, uh, magnetic north and true north are in the same direction by coincidence. But over here in Montana, when we look at Hudson Bay in Canada, we're looking a very different direction than we, when we look towards the North Pole. And so for us, there's going to be a difference between what is called magnetic north and true north. And that declination, I, uh, online it says it's 12 degrees, but I've been taught in Boy Scouts that it's closer to 16 degrees, so I'm not sure what the truth is anymore. Does anyone know what it is in Bozeman? Is it maybe because the pole is moving? What's that? Oh, uh, you're bringing my age into account. Huh? Yeah, yeah that's, that seems unfair. <laughs> yeah, it is moving. I don't think it's been moving that much. <laughs> is, is there an explanation as to why there's an adult here that Ah, you know, that, that is still not uh, agreed upon science. There's uh, a theory of what causes that field that has to do with the movement of charge underneath the, uh, the surface of the Earth, uh, the dynamo attack. But um, what causes the flip is not fully understood. We just see it in the, in the ge geologic record, the dinosaur people do. <laughs> yes, on a, on a compass, uh, you have to know what the difference is, and you have to adjust your compass accordingly. Uh, some of the newer compasses that are more expensive, uh, you can essentially build that in. Uh, you can tell it where you're at, and it'll... What about the compass on my phone? That has it already built in. Uh, it, that was a pretty expensive compass, wasn't it? Yeah, okay. Again, the stuff that will not be on the test. Um, just like we used electric field lines to paint a picture of the electric field everywhere in the room so that we could visualize where the field was strong, where it was weak, where it was pointing this way, where it was pointing that way, we do the same thing with magnetic field lines. Only the difference between magnetic field lines, we'll find in tutorial this week, is that they don't end. Electric field lines were born on positive charge and they died on negative charge. But we're going to find that uh, magnetic field lines just close on themselves. They always make loops. And so they appear to come out of a North Pole and go into a South Pole, but then they keep going inside the metal and close the loop. And so we're going to find in tutorial this week that the field lines go out of a north into a south, but inside the metal they're going from south to north to complete the circle. Okay? Now you'll notice, just like with the electric field and electric field lines, we got to keep the two separate. The magnetic field is a vector. It points one direction and it gives me the magnetic field at one location, the tail of the vector. The field lines, the green lines, they paint the picture everywhere. They tell me the field is strong here, where the field lines are close together. It's weak out here, where the field lines are far apart. And these vectors, the magnetic field, 
is always tangent to the magnetic field lines, the representation. Okay? Is that all coming back from our study of electric fields and electric field lines? Now, those loops uh, should look familiar. Okay, we've seen them before. We've seen them there. That looks like the magnetic field lines. Uh, look at how I spent a lot of time getting that to match. I want you to appreciate it. <laughs> oh, those lines, see that line just keeps on going. I searched the inner tubes. Okay, now, when we saw those prominences on the surface of the sun, what we were seeing were magnetic field lines. There was a, an anchor point that was a magnetic north pole, there was an anchor point that was a magnetic south pole, and these field lines connected the two, and when they got loaded down with charged particles, they glowed, okay? And, uh, and that's what you're seeing there. But why do these charged particles get trapped in the magnetic field lines? Why are they forced to go along the field lines? That's the piece that we need to talk about. And we're going to talk about that with this demo. I'm going to get all the magnets away. What I have here is a cathode ray tube. And it's essentially an old TV. This is the way TVs work when I was alive, okay? That's why they were so fat, is because we had uh, an electron gun in the back. What it was is just a very negative terminal. We call it a cathode. And then up towards you in the living room, there was a positive uh, terminal called an anode. And if you get the voltage between those big enough, you can actually rip electrons off the cathode and toward, have them sent towards the anode. Now you'll notice that that anode is offset, okay? Now the reason for that is that you rip off the electrons, you send them in the direction of the anode, but then just like a bullfighter, it's ole, and the electron goes right past, okay? And the electron hits this screen which is painted with a phosphorus material that glows when it's excited. Now on an old TV set, instead of just glowing green, we would have uh, dots that glowed red, green, and blue. And they would be in little triads all over the front of your TV. And this beam would sweep back and forth and excite those triads. Now, if I think of this beam as starting here, racing past here and going right towards you, okay? The question is, what direction is that beam going to be pushed when I bring a north pole up next to it? Let me show you what I mean. There's the beam of electrons coming out towards you. Electrons are negative, remember that. Negative electrons racing towards you. If I bring that north pole there, what direction is the magnetic field due to that north pole at the location of the beam? Remember, it comes out of the north and goes into a south. Okay, that's pretty much all you need to remember with bar magnets, is that if you're near the north pole, it's away. If you're near the south pole, it's towards. And I'm, I'm drawing the magnetic field. Okay? Now, sure, it wraps around and goes back, but if I'm on the symmetry axis, it's just away from the north towards the south. So, if those are negative electrons, which way are they going to be pushed by the magnetic field? Is it going to be right, left, up, or down with your clicker? Right, left, up, or down? <coughs> Okay. Why? 
Folks, if we all get this one right, I take us all to Hawaii. Yes, yes I will. Oh, but we didn't all get it right, did we? Oh, but you're thinking, you're thinking, if it just weren't for these three people and these three people. Well, I'm here to tell you, those three people got it right. I really should take those three people to Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. <laughs> the answer is down. Let me prove it. Let me prove it. Okay, the beam is coming right toward you, sir. I bring in the North Pole. What did it do? Down. It went down. Can you see that over there? Down. See it over here? <laughs> that is way weird. Okay, here's the point I'm trying to make. The magnetic force is goofy in the same way that torque in our study 205 was goofy. You remember that every time we tried to turn a, steering, uh, a spinning wheel, it ended up going 90 degrees to the direction we were pushing. It seemed like everything was just completely weird. And that's why we left rotation till the end of 205. And that's why we leave magnetic, magnetic fields and forces to the end of 207. It's always going to be 90 degrees to the direction you expect it to be. Okay? Now, what we find is that for a charged particle to experience a force due to a magnetic field, first and foremost, there has to be motion. If I have an electron sitting on this table and I come up to it, ha! it doesn't even know I've got a magnet in my hand. If it's not moving, it does not feel the magnetic field. Now it's worse than that. It turns out that if I could create a magnetic field, a very strong magnetic field, pointing towards that open door, if I were to shoot electrons along the field, or opposite the field, they would feel nothing. Absolutely nothing. Now, if you tried to, to shoot the electrons across the field, it's going to feel a force, and that force is going to be perpendicular to the field and the velocity. Now, look at this. If I have a positive charge, and it's moving that way, in a magnetic field that is that way, the force, the magnetic force, has to be perpendicular to this vector, and it has to be perpendicular to that vector. Now these two vectors define a plane the plane of the whiteboard. And the only way that force can be perpendicular to both of them is if it is perpendicular to the whiteboard. So the only possible directions for this force are into the board or out of the board. It's going to be one of those. But you can see that if I draw the problem on your final exam on a two-dimensional piece of paper, the force is going to be out of the page or into the page, meaning these problems are all inherently three-dimensional. That's what you found with rotation, that all rotation problems were inherently three-dimensional. Ah, we're getting to that. We're getting to that. Um, I'm, I'm almost there. The question was, why did the beam go down? I'll show you. What's that? Uh, if it were positive charges, it would have gone up. But they were negative charges, so they went down. Okay. Nope, that was exactly what I said. Okay. 
Oh, I didn't hear the explanation because I don't have my hearing aid, so I just saw your lips moving. <laughs> You're good. You're okay. okay, thank you. Just nod. It's what you do with tourists from out of town. Okay? Now, before we finish talking about the direction, let's talk about the size. We find that this force, magnetic force, is proportional to three things. The perpendicular component of the velocity, the size of the charge in coulombs, and the size of the field. That means we can write it like this, where k is a constant of proportionality, and it's proportional to these three things. Now we've defined the units of force to be newtons. We've defined the charge unit to be coulombs, and we measure velocities in meters per second. But we haven't yet defined a unit for the magnetic field strength. If we're careful with our choice, we can simplify this equation and make this constant of proportionality go to 1. And that choice is to measure the magnetic field in what are known as Tesla. If we measure them in Tesla fields, uh, what we get is a constant of proportionality that's equal to 1. Now, it turns out that there is a competing unit. It turns out that the Earth's magnetic field is a very small field. It's about 10 to the minus 4 Tesla. And so, um, there's another unit that is popular. And that is the Gauss. That's an S7. Okay, so um, we say that the Earth's magnetic field is about one Gauss or about 10 to the minus 4 Tesla. The official units in MKS are Tesla. Uh, but the Tesla is a very large unit. Um, a, a small bar magnet has a field that's about a hundredth of a Tesla. If you, t if you have an MRI, you're being exposed to two or three Tesla. We have a magnet lab on the second floor that has magnetic fields up to 30 Tesla. What that means is if you go into that room, your credit cards are toast. You, you, you no longer have credit. <laughs> they, don't, they don't work anymore. Okay. Now, it's the part of the velocity that tries to go across the magnetic field that creates the force. If these are the field lines, these lines that are down and evenly spaced, all of these charges have the same magnetic force. Uh, that's V per, all of it is V per, but here it's only the part that's going across the field, but that's the same as the V perp in the first one, and that's the same as the V-perp in that one as well. Now a negative charge has to be going the opposite direction to feel a magnetic force that's the same as the others. So, let's get down to it. How do I know which of these directions is the right direction? Into the board or out of the board? Well, just like we had a right-hand rule when we were talking about rotation and torque, we have a right-hand rule for the magnetic force. And here it is. First and foremost, there is no magnetic force unless the charge is moving. So you take your right hand and you reach in the direction of the motion. Reach in the direction of the motion. It's kind of like Richard Simmons. Does that give you a visual? Okay. <laughs> And then you turn your wrist. This is the most important part. You reach and you turn your wrist so that you can wave in the direction of the B field. When you wave in the direction of the B field, your thumb is going to be pointing either into the page or out of the page. It will tell you 
the direction of the magnetic force on a positive charge. If you're dealing with a, an electron, you do it the other way. You do it the other way. So let's try that cathode ray tube again. Let's do it this time, but with a magnetic field, I'm going to come down like this on the beam. Okay? Now, electrons that are coming out towards you, and the B field is down and to your left. And that means the force on a positive charge is going to be down and to your right. Okay? It should be that way for positive charges. What way is it actually going to be pushed? Up and to the left. Let's see if that's true. Let's see if that's true. Up and to the left. 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 Now you see why it went down when I came this way. If I reach in the direction of the motion, I swing my hand in the direction of the B field towards the open door, that gave my thumb up, but they're electrons, so it goes down. Okay? Isn't that fun? Isn't that fun? Okay. Like that. Okay. Folks, we've run out of uh, stuff to learn. We'll see you on Wednesday.